Good morning and welcome to To The Point. This week, our pollsters at Epic MRA delivered some new polling numbers that show that the election in May could be in question. That election is where you will be asked to decide if you'd like to raise the sales tax to 7%. That would be part of a plan to help fund road repairs in the state along with a number of other items. But those numbers are not particularly favorable some three plus months out. We sat down with the Lieutenant Governor, Brian Kelly to talk about that and other issues earlier this week. Let's start by talking about something that, frankly, I was surprised by, and that was the road deal that was finally put together in the lame duck session. We're going to talk about some numbers here in just a minute, and as you will tell me, polling can be all over the place, but I, we've got some polling numbers that I find interesting. But first, let's talk about that process, because the final plan that came out is not at all what I was expecting, at least from what I had heard from people who seemed to be pretty close to the discussion. Was it considerably different than where it started? Everybody had to compromise in order to come up with a, a package of bills that was uh, accepted by the various different parties involved in the, in the legislature and the governor. And so it, it really what, what, the, what the group did was started with a set of principles, things that they wanted to achieve with a package, and this was a package that that hit all of those points, like uh, removing the sales tax from gasoline so that the, the tax on our gas and diesel doesn't get high compared to other states. And then how do you protect schools and local governments from, uh, from moving, removing the sales tax from, from gasoline? And this brought everything together in order to achieve all of those objectives. And now it is all contingent on a vote in May. And I want to talk to you about these numbers. These are from our pollster at Epic MRA. And they did it two ways. They first just took uh, a look at the plurality of voters and how people would vote just asking the question generically. And it's, uh, it's interesting because it says 46% of people said they would vote yes to the proposal. 41% said they would vote no. But after they learned the detail, and again, it's uh, always a question of who explains the detail, but after they explained the detail, and we assume by that uh, talking about raising the sales tax, 47% of those polled said that they would not vote for it, and only 38% said they would vote for it. Now, we're four months in that neighborhood before this vote's going to take place. Uh, you and the governor are going to have to be the point people, I assume, on, on convincing people or at least communicating this message. What do you tell people about that? Really, this is, the, this is our best shot at fixing our roads and our bridges. It's a, it's a public safety issue. It's also a cost issue when it comes to their vehicle repairs in Michigan being about 130 bucks more per year than our neighbors to the south in Indiana. These are the sorts of things, the frustrations that people have and experience on a day-to-day -day basis driving on Michigan roadways. And then unfortunately there is a, uh, the, there is a cost in terms of, of safety, public safety, lives and injuries and, and property damage because of bad roads as well. That's a risk that we, we really can't afford to take anymore. And this is a, a proposal that once we, we really do communicate that it, it fixes our roads in our bridges. It, uh, it protects schools and, and local governments in the process. It makes sure that our lower income working adults um, are, uh, are, are protected from, uh, from extra costs as well. And, uh, and, and at the end of the day, it creates a more competitive Michigan overall. So when, when the whole package is presented, I think that it's something that people are, will really be able to rally around. When you think of this in, in terms of yet another election, you and I talked not long ago, and you've had more than your share because uh, there was a challenge uh, for you as lieutenant governor going in to the state convention, uh, and no small matter of a general election that you just got through. Are you getting weary of campaigns, or are you geared up and ready to go on this one? We are ready to go. You can't really afford to be weary in, uh, when you work in, the, in public policy. Uh, particularly when time is short, and we, this is something that we really need to, to solve. Every day we are putting lives at risk, risk and injuries uh, uh, and, and property damage because of the condition of our roadways. So we're determined to, to move forward and to, uh, and, to, and to both fix the roads and bridges, uh, but then to also make sure that Michigan stays uh, competitive and we keep our, um, our, our schools and our local governments whole. Let's talk about something that you're somewhat of an expert on, and that's the state budget. You have been there when it has been an absolute disaster. You have been there when it has looked considerably better in the past few years. 
I would suggest this year might be a bit of a hybrid, certainly not nearly as devastating as it was a decade ago, but largely because of some people that had the ability to take advantage of some tax credits, there is a, a respectable size hole in, in the revenues uh, that you would like to have versus where you really are. Would a positive vote in May help that issue as well, that, that shortfall? There is a lot of pressure that is that is, that is put on the state budget just year over year for um, uh, for a, a lot of things that we that we work to uh, to contain and to to keep a, a prudent but budget and debt management strategy and paying off debt o over the long term. Um, pay, passing this in May, what that does, it doesn't so much make the the budget itself easier. It just makes it possible for us to balance the budget and fix our roads. Uh, absent a positive vote in May then it's, it, it does create a scenario where the amount of resources that will be available for our roads uh, will simply be inadequate to give our people the types of roads that they deserve and expect. Uh, let's talk about the budget because the budget process starts right now. Well, effectively, it'll start on the 11th when the governor rolls out his budget priorities. But the work has already begun. No doubt, I know you said you met with some new uh, legislators not long ago, and, and I'm sure that you talked to them about the budget process because it is very complex, particularly for people who can only serve for six years. Uh, it's kind of a steep learning curve if you're on that appropriations committee. What do you think you have to do to balance a budget, which is constitutionally mandated, given the pressures that are on this this coming budget? Really, the, the key is to make sure you're making the decisions this year that uh, that incorporate all the considerations on into the future and so every time that we that we establish a budget we need to make sure that we're saving for the future that we are making all of the debt payments reducing the overall debt and liability of the state of michigan and then uh and, and then of course making sure that you're you're paying for your top priorities and in the in the process it's also an opportunity to go literally line by line and review the efficiency and the effectiveness of the things that state government is doing looking for places that we can improve or do better so we look at it as the you know it's the budget but it's also a policy discussion to make sure that throughout that process of allocation of resources that we are doing the very best that we can uh, in providing the best value for the dollar for the taxpayers what do you see when you look over the new legislature with nice majorities for Republicans. And if you're a Republican over in the executive office, you've got to, you got to like that until you consider that some of those guys may be pushing initiatives that you and or the governor haven't necessarily signed on to. That's the longer term issue. But in the short term, big numbers over in the Senate, bigger than I've ever seen in the time I've covered, uh, and a comfortable margin in the House. What do you, what do you make of this new set of legislators? I'm really excited to get to work with this with this group. The, those that we engaged in the reinvention over the course of the last four years were, were really a pleasure to work with. We had disagreements, but, but really overall, uh, we were able to set a whole different course and trajectory of our state. But now we're transitioning from most of our time being fixing problems from the past to, uh, to, to building the best type of future that we, uh, that we possibly can. And it's a group that I'm very confident is up for the task. One of the things that we've already heard the House talking about is abolishing the prevailing wage. I haven't spoken directly to the governor about it, but I get the sense this is not a priority for him. Uh, does something like that, if they pursue that, does that create a, a problem between the executive and the, the legislative branch? The governor has made it clear that he didn't support the repeal of the prevailing wage in the first term and he's not going to um, in the second term. As a practical matter on, um, on transportation projects, uh, all of the, even if we were to repeal the prevailing wage at the state level, it wouldn't make any difference in our road project costs because we still have to comply with the Davis-Bacon Act. And so that is a, um, I mean, it's a discussion. I think it's, it's healthy to have these types of debates, but as a practical matter, it wouldn't change the, uh, the you know, the overall transportation discussion that we're having today. And, and just to clarify, Davis-Bacon is a federal uh, bill that says that if federal money is involved in a road project, and it can be as little as a dollar, right. then the prevailing wage is still intact. And there are no road projects in the state of Michigan that don't have at least some federal money in them, that, speaking broadly. Right, and when you when you consider that our um, that our, our projects that that we um, whether you're talking about a local city, a county project, or a state highway, that those are all um, local, state, and federal government partnerships, 
And so the Davis-Bacon Act would still apply even if the prevailing wage was repealed. Let's talk a little bit about what you and the governor would like to accomplish. We heard a lot during the State of the State address, but after completing the first four years where you said it a moment ago, but in, in very real terms, you were dealing with kind of catching up with wherever the state had been over the last decade or, or perhaps more. Now with th these four years ahead of you, do you feel like you have the opportunity to kind of set your own agenda and try to achieve some things rather than drinking from the fire hose and trying to, to catch up? This is our chance to uh, to redesign government around the the best interests and the needs of people. The old the old system was one that said, okay, here's a bunch of programs, and then it required people to conform to the artificial constructs of those programs. And it, it just hasn't been effective. There's so much bureaucratic cost to it. And what we want to do is put more of the resources toward uh, toward helping people in ways that are relevant and effective and efficient. And, uh, and so we, we're excited about this. We think this could really change, it could change everything about state government, but especially the outcomes when, when it comes to trying to help people that have struggled with independence in the past, instead of having programs to help people maintain where they're at, why not construct the, the type of solutions that will move people toward more independence, less dependence on the government, and more independence means more freedom, it means more opportunity to pursue their hopes and their dreams, all their aspirations. And that, that's really the opportunity in front of us right now is to, is to take advantage of having fiscal crisis behind us and, and fully embrace the future for everything it could be. One of those big things that the governor talked about is combining a couple of big agencies, coming up with an agency of 14,000, something like that, a, a, an amazing number of people but making the agency more of a, my words, not yours, one-stop shop. In other words, have the services that people go for available on a more direct basis rather than having to go to point A for this service and point B for this service. How difficult is that when you try to combine bureaucracy? I'm not using that with a negative to uh, connotation that a lot of people do, but it is a, a lot of people and a lot of uh, command and control structures that are, have to be integrated. That's no small feat. Whenever you change the way that government is operating, trying to, uh, to it's a really a, a culture change in the way, in both outlook and operation of government. That, that's never easy. But I will say that we have tried it in some areas that have been very successful. Pathways to Potential, for example, where we take our DHS caseworkers and we put them in the at-risk schools. And uh, that was an idea that we actually got from Grand Rapids, a school in Grand Rapids that was, that was, uh, that was trying that type of an approach before. And it's been hugely successful because people don't have to find us. We're right there where they're at already. Uh, and then within the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, we're also in, in uh, Community Ventures going after this, the population that has been structurally unemployed, unemployed for a very long time, maybe never had a job, finding out what is the roadblock to their employment and then fixing that problem. So in other words, we conform to their needs to help them become independent as opposed to trying to fit them into some sort of a program. It's worked in a couple of different areas and we're ready to scale this up. Finally, let me ask you this. You served on the county commission. Um, I met you when you went into the state house. Uh, you were about to become a state senator. Uh, I don't make predictions on elections, but since that one's already passed, I'll predict you would have won that race. You would have been a state senator. Uh, instead, you were asked and accepted uh, uh, the invitation to be uh, Rick Snyder's running mate. You have been elected twice now to lieutenant governor. What's next for you? I'm really so laser focused on this uh, on this effort to redesign state government. Really excited for what that could mean. Can't really afford to think about, I, you know, people in politics are always thinking about their next step. It makes them too afraid to take chances and make changes and be, and be bold. So I'm living in today, right now, and I'm sure the future will take care of itself. The question about how to fix Michigan roads is still an open one, and over the next 90 days or so, you can expect the conversation and campaign for that road tax to heat up. And we'll be back with more To The Point in just a moment. Welcome back to To The Point. This week in the United States Senate, there was a vote on the Keystone XL pipeline. Ultimately, that vote was successful, but it seems highly unlikely that that will change the fate of that pipeline by the time it gets to the White House, if in fact it does. But 
we had an opportunity to talk with the new junior senator from the state about his view on the pipeline. This was prior to the vote on the pipeline, in fact, prior to a vote on two of his amendments, which ultimately failed. Senator Gary Peters also voted against the underlying bill, but this is the conversation we had before either of those votes took place. Let's start with the amendments that you have introduced that deal with Keystone Pipeline, or at least are going to be connected with that. They actually deal with pipeline safety in a broader scale. Talk to me about your purpose in introducing those. Well, I'm very concerned uh, about pipeline safety uh, generally. Obviously, we've got a keystone bill before us uh, to deal with the pipeline crossing the center part of the country, but my focus is pipeline safety in the Great Lakes in particular, a sacred trust that we have, and I'm very concerned, as I know many people are concerned, about an oil pipeline that currently exists in the Straits of Mackinac that uh, comes across from the Upper Peninsula down to the UP, uh, or from UP down to the Lower Peninsula. And, you know, those of us in Michigan, uh, we should uh, fully appreciate how important it is to have pipeline safety in place. We had a major disaster on the Kalamazoo River just a few years ago. In fact, it's been the most expensive pipeline break in the history of this country. Over $1.2 billion has already been spent in the cleanup, and they're still in the process of the cleanup. So when we have that kind of mess that has already occurred in Michigan in the Kalamazoo River, I am very concerned about the Great Lakes. It would be absolutely catastrophic to have a pipeline break in the Great Lakes. And so uh, my amendment uh, says that before we go forward, we have to have assurances that the agency that is entrusted with uh, inspecting that pipeline has the resources they need, the personnel they need, and we need to have a report. If there are additional safeguards that need to be incorporated in that pipeline, we need to do it, and we need to do it now. I think everybody understands and appreciates the necessity for safety of pipelines, and we have seen recently a number of pipeline breaks uh, and other, uh, not on the scale of Kalamazoo, but certainly anytime you have one of these explosions or a break, it raises uh, concerns. But but this amendment doesn't deal specifically with Keystone, does it, as much as it, it deals with the pipeline safety, as you described, the one in the Great Lakes and others. Is, is, would that be accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Yeah, this, this amendment uh, basically says we don't move forward until we have those kinds of insurances. And basically it deals with Keystone and says before we're building other pipelines, let's make sure the ones that we have in place now are as safe as they possibly can be, and we are taking every single precaution. And when it comes to pipeline safety, I, I can't think of a place that is more fragile and more vulnerable than the Great Lakes. Uh, especially with tar sands oil. This uh, Canadian tar sands oil is heavier than water. So unlike other oil that floats on the surface, which is still a problem cleaning up, but this is oil that sinks. And so sinking oil in water is very difficult to clean up. And that's what we've seen in Kalamazoo. And we certainly can't see it in the Great Lakes. L let's talk about Keystone for a minute. This has been a political hot button now for years. The president uh, referenced it uh, in a none too flattering way in the State of the Union last week. Uh, many Democrats are just opposed to this, uh, even if Republicans can muster the votes to get this push through. Uh, the president isn't going to look at this favorably, is he? Uh, I don't think so. The president has said that uh, he will veto this legislation. Uh, basically, when it comes to citing pipelines, the, the president has the authority to do that, and the various government agencies uh, cite uh, the uh, pipelines. It is unusual to have a congressional vote. Uh, to have the United States Senate uh, basically debating the citing of one individual pipeline that just never occurs. Uh, so this is uh, very unusual to do this. Uh, this. There's a lot of reasons, I suppose, for it, but we have to re you know, remind your viewers this is a uh, Canadian oil that is basically heading to international markets, places like China and other places, uh, just crossing the United States. The Canadians certainly want this. They want to sell their oil to China and other places. But if they're going to cross the United States, in my view, we better be absolutely certain that it is as safe as possible, uh, particularly this uh, tar sands oil. And when you're going across the central part of the country, you've got the Agal aquifer. You've got a lot of farmers that are very concerned about this going through uh, their area of the country. And quite frankly, a lot of uh, farmers and people are really concerned that you've got eminent domain. You've got the government taking their land uh, for a Canadian uh, oil company. A foreign company is basically taking U.S. citizens' land so they can sell their oil to China and other places. So uh, it is certainly very controversial. If we move past the Keystone for a minute, talk to me about the general mood in Washington. You and I talked last week. There was a lot of excitement when the president was getting ready to deliver his State of the Union address. But after that address, and, and obviously uh, the partisan response to it, one of the first things that you're dealing with now is a pipeline bill that the president likely won't sign even if it's passed. How much of what we're going to see in the next two years is going to be more of the continuation of partisan bickering that we've seen for the past six? 
Well, I, I just hope it isn't. It, it can. I'm going to do everything in my power not to uh, allow that to happen, uh, reach across the aisle, develop uh, those relationships. In fact, now I'm, I'm new to the Senate, uh, but two of the freshmen that I'm with uh, are friends that I had in the House, Republicans uh, from Colorado and from West Virginia. We're going to be working on bipartisan legislation we'll be introducing uh, shortly, similar to what we did in the House. And, and that's what we have to do. We've got to come together, find that middle ground. But, you know, it's also about both sides. The Republicans have the majority now. And I hope uh, as they talk about bipartisanship, that doesn't mean just uh, that Democrats will accept whatever they put on the table and just accept it 100 percent. It means you've got to find middle ground. And that means give and take. Uh, Republicans have to accept some Democratic ideas. Democrats will accept Republican ideas. But bottom line, and the way I look at this, we should not be even thinking about Democratic ideas and Republican ideas. We should just be thinking about ideas that are good for the country, ideas that are, are great for Michigan. And if we focus on that, I believe that we can get things done. And I'm going to be reminding my colleagues uh, every day that I'm here, let's focus on what's right for the country, take the labels off and figure out what we have to do to solve some of the really tough problems we face in our state and in our country. Senator, as always, we appreciate your time. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. The question on real bipartisan cooperation and on the Keystone XL pipeline both seem to be unsettled, but at least for now, both seem to be a long shot in Washington. We'll be back with more To The Point in just a moment. So this morning's program has more questions than answers. What exactly will happen with the Keystone XL pipeline? What about bipartisan cooperation in Washington? And what will happen to Michigan roads and the sales tax increase that you'll be voting on in May? Those are all things we will continue to cover, but there's much more going on already. It's time to start thinking about Decision 2016. The presidential sweepstakes are starting to heat up. How will Michigan play in that big game? And also, what will happen as we move closer and closer to another election cycle to the prospect of anything happening in either Lansing or Washington? We'll be talking about all of that when you join us every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on Wood TV for To The Point.